join me in welcoming Dr. Ayelet Zohar. Thank you, Jennifer, for the very flattering introduction. Uh, some of the titles I would probably not mention or forgot about already, but thank you anyway. And uh, thank you, of course, for inviting me for the uh, presentation today here at the Center of Japanese Studies and at the symposium that will be on Saturday. And um, I am most delighted to discover this part of America. I just mentioned it to some of you here that it's my first time to be not on the coast of the New World. In February 1974, some 29 years after the end of World War II and more than a decade after failing attempts by the Japanese government and Onoda's family to establish contact with Japanese Imperial Army officer Onoda Hiro, one of the last Japanese holdouts still hiding at the thick forest of Lubang Island in the Philippines, the Japanese youngster, Suzuki Norio, decided to take an adventurous trip to the Philippines to find Onoda all by himself. Suzuki set his tent close to where he believed Onoda was hiding, waiting patiently at one of the spots uh, to which Onoda used to come and collect food. And four days later, Onoda revealed himself. The two started chatting, and a favorable bond was immediately formed between them. Suzuki tried to convince Onoda that the war was over and that he should come out of the jungle and return to Japan. Onoda, on the other hand, refused to surrender until he received a clear order from Major Taniguchi Yoshimi, his personal commander during the war years. According to Onoda, there were actually two photo shootings events, one during the first evening, soon after their initial meeting when Suzuki took two pictures with a flashlight in the dark, but seemed uh, dissatisfied. Quote, I'm not too confident about these flashbulb shots. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a daylight shot tomorrow, end quote, he requested. The, the second series was taken on the following morning in full daylight. Suzuki shot several pictures of Onoda all by himself, and then a couple of images, uh, the cu a couple of pictures with the two of them together. Also, also, according to Onoda, the picture of the two of them together was taken by Suzuki to avoid any suspicion that he had faked or forged the images. Onoda was fully aware of the consequences of letting the young men take the pictures. Suzuki, promising Onoda to return with Major Taniguchi, equipped with the film of the sensational pictures, hurried back to Japan the next morning to find veteran officer Taniguchi and to make the public the photographs of Onoda and himself. Indeed, the Japanese media immediately published the photographs. On 27th February 1974, the following, and the following days, Suzuki's images were published by Japan's major newspapers, Asahi Shimbun, Yomiuri Shimbun, Mainichi Shimbun, on their front pages, creating quite a stir. Borrowing the title of the series from Diane Arbor's famous image, Identical Twins, Tsukada Mam from 1967, Tsukada Mamoru, who was born in 1962 in Nagano, Japan, Identical Twin series, was created in 2003. His models are a carefully chosen pair of identical twins whom he personally knew. Two cycles of 29 years are opened here. One of his images and his emergence from the jungle happened in 1974, 29 years after the end of World War II. Tsukada's work was taken in 2003, exactly 29 years after Suzuki's images were shot, repeating the generational difference, performing the continuous tensions with the specters of the empire, nationalism and militarism, and the change in photographic discourses, referring to the continuous negotiations of contemporary generations with the inglorious past of the nation. While Suzuki's images document Onoda's emergence from the jungle and work in the space of war memory and the revived pain Japanese society faced when confronting its imperial past, Tsukada's series echoes the public debate and the national deliberation around the possibility of Japanese political and military involvement in the Iraq War. 
When comparing Tsukada's images to Suzuki's, it is necessary to know that Tsukada was not aware of Suzuki's images, had no prior association with them, and did not approve of the ju juxtaposition and relationship established between the two series, as I discussed in this current text. The two series challenged the viewer to reconsider the Pacific War, considering issues irrelevant to war memory in Japan, as these were embodied during the time of Onoda's repatriation and echoed again in 2003 with debates around the possibilities of Japan participation in the war effort in Iraq. These debates perform the background and the raison d'etre of the two series, each of the specific political climate and social debate. The first issue I would like to bring forward concerns the presence of the specters and the ghost in relation to photojournalism and stage photography. This discussion concerns the, sta the status of fo the photograph as evidence or a realistic agent in the service of visual cultural discourses. The picture of Onoda and Suzuki together was, as far as Suzuki was concerned, the proof of the trustworthiness of his images, or in Roland Barthes' wording, the indexical reference to that has been, cela a été, or the evidence that they really met and that the pictures of Onoda were genuine. The meaning of being or being in the Barthian's context is a complex con concept, as Barthes' book is imbued with death from the death of, of Bart's mother to his own death and the death of the he dis, declares to be hanging over every image that contains the catastrophe of coming death. If death is it, then all we see in the photograph is the specter, the apparition of that has been alive once but no more. Therefore, to follow Bart's thought, if Onoda's presence on Lubang Island was ghost-like, then Suzuki's images had finally performed its ghostly actuality. Suzuki's intention was to prove Onoda's existence in a procedure resembling a report that would be published on a newspaper page. Therefore, the, photograph call, the photographs call for a reading in the context of photojournalism, despite the fact that Suzuki was an amateur with no photographic, fo fo no journalistic background. Suzuki's images, therefore, are not concerned so much with the construction of the frame or its aesthetics, but they belong, their highest value was derived from the fact that the subject picture was Zonoda himself, accompanied by Suzuki, the photographer. Suzuki's pictures perform the photograph as proof of presence that has been registration of being, emotions, or a presen presentation of a story like the performance of the ghost Leonoda and our unexpected relationship established between the two, the unexpected relationship. The series is informal and has a light-hearted quality, displaying Suzuki and Onoda with all smiles, Suzuki holding Onoda's rifle, both pose in, in front of the camera in a playful manner after seemingly achieving a certain level of trust and confidence in each other. These pictures have historical value as the embodiment of Onoda's spectre, which for decades was only a rumor, a passing sight, or a legend, as he was last confirmed seen 29 years earlier while serving as an intelligence officer in Japan's Imperial Army on Lubang Island. Until the po photograph proved the contrary, another was a ghost, an apparition, or a spirit, officially declared dead in 1959. Yet reports of his presence as a walking phantom in the Philippine jungle persisted, inspiring Suzuki's desire to unravel the mystery. The two aspects, the material and the tense of the spectra, work in tandem with the presence of another in the jungle, living on the edge between, the li between life and death, being an absence, killing and disappearance. Onoda performed the first part of Derrida's definition of the spectra, during the period of his presence on Lubang Island. However, a sense of temporality came to life upon his return to Japan. As long as he was a specter on Lubang, he was placed in the unconscious territory of Japanese society. Once brought back to the center of public arena, returning from death, materialized in the flesh back in his home country, another performed the tense confusion 
and the presence of the past in the modelized present, performing the second part of Derrida's articulation of the ghost. In his book, Spectres of Marx, Derrida articulates the difference between the spectre, the spirit, and the ghost. The spirit is the materialistic aspect, having a figured past and future, while the spectre is most abstract. Yet, Derrida is not just looking at the duality of the material abstract presence of the apparition, but also considers questions of, ghosts, of the ghost's tense. Tsukada's identical twin series tackles the dilemma of fiction making as an embodiment of a fabricated, well-organized and staged narrative that undermines the documentary assumptions presented earlier in relation to Suzuki's images. Tsukada's images occupy a fictional space that lies between the material information about the identity of the photographed subjects. If another image is a performance of, of the revival of the ghost, the coming back to life of the dead, Tsukada's series performs a much more problematic aspect, that of the abstract characteristics of the spectre or the idea of the ghosts of war, the non-present, the spectacle of the spectrum, if to quote Bart's wording. Tsukada's identical twins, therefore, are not individuals the, the spectator can identify with or be curious about their identity. The photographs block this route. Instead, they become the spectres of the past, the apparitions of time lost, and the ghost, ghosts of Japan's missing decades in the Pacific War. Additionally, the choice of twins, a natural doubling, returns back to the discourses that identified photography as a doubling process, a repetition of certainty, a copy of the real. The twins are, in a sense, a metaphor of the photographic process per se, before delving into issues of their specific role in this series. Tsukada's reference to Diane Arbus' identical twins endorses the discussion around personal and collective identity in historical and cultural contexts in a multifaceted manner. As mentioned, for identical twin series, Tsukada chose a pair of twins whom he knew personally. One of the brothers was working as a lifeguard in the neighborhood swimming pool where Tsukada used to practice. And later on, Tsukada liaised with the men, requesting them to model for the series. Although Tsukada sta states that he became friendly with the twins and knows them well, the specific identities, names, or life circumstances are not revealed as part of the process. They remain completely anonymous. Therefore, from the viewer's point of view, they function as signifiers rather than actual people, unlike the case of Suzuki Onoda's photographs, where the persona of the photograph was at the heart of the project and its most meaningful element. In this photographic event, however, the subjects simply performed the task initiated by the artist, as models are expected to do, without disclosing any personal information about themselves. Second reading of Suzuki and, and, and Tsukada's images expands on issues reading the nature of the photographs in terms of its indexicality and performativity and in relation to the presence of the civilian and the soldier. Starting with Suzuki's series, I read it in regard to the theories relating to the nature of the photographic image as, as these were understood during the time of the picture's production in the 1970s. Therefore, the evidential or the indexical qualities of these photographs as the first proof on, of an author's existence since his disappearance in 1945 are read in relation to contemporaries' writings on photography and indexicality. In her 1977 text on photography and the indexical sign, Rosalind Krauss established the necessary link between the photograph as a documentary mechanism, a witness, and a recording device of the trendy performance actions that flourished in those days and pierced discussions of, discussion of the index. Photographs, especially instantaneous photographs, are very in instructive because we know they are certain respects exactly like the pro objects they represent. But this resemblance is due to the photograph having been produced under such circumstances that they were physically forced to correspond point to point to nature. In that aspect, then, they belong to the second class of signs in Dices, those made by physical connection of Pierce um, um, definitions. 
According to Onoda's text, Suzuki was fully aware of the impact of his picture shooting act performance. Suzuki directed Onoda, took the picture on two separate occasions, and also acted on the ultimate performance of the photographic index. The photographer moved from behind the camera into the frame, taking a picture of himself with Onoda, performing the moment of total indexicality. In Suzuki's image, the photographer is part of the image as its creator as well as a performer, and his image is part of the manipulated index registered for the future as a pr proof of presence. The image shows the Imperial Army officer with the carefree Japanese youngster on an adventurous trip to find Onoda, the p a panda, and the yeti, all smiles holding Onoda's rifle. That's a quote from his book. That's what he said he was after. Um, while the mature officer is directing his gaze at the camera, showing off the imperial crest engraved onto his rifle's side, staging the ultimate moment of performative being here. The shift that took place in the last decade from clear material evidence into territories of imaging and simulations also corresponds to technical changes between the two series. Suzuki's negatives were first developed in the traditional darkroom, later printed on newspaper stock and disseminated by print media, thereby entering the territory of photojournalism as a general category. The pictures of Onoda were published as black and white images throughout the Japanese and international media. This was in 1974, still in the era of wet chemical photography. Since then, the world of photography has dramatically shifted nearly exclusively into the digital realm, and photography theory was thrown into some bitter debates about the nature of the photograph and its role in contemporary society. Moreover, the idea of indexicality as proof of the steadfastness of the photograph has been dramatically challenged by the introduction of digital photography and multimedia manipulation. A more complex analysis can also put Suzuki's image on this very platform. Suzuki's images of Onoda juxtapose two Japanese histories pertinent to two generations, an old imperial Japan and a modern post-war one. Nonetheless, the photographs represent a certain attraction and an empathy of, for the older generation, the burden carried by these people, and the great desire to reveal the secrets of old times, combined with the desire to open the hidden wound that which is concealed, yet very painful, under the old generation's skin. Suzuki's photographs were not prepared with deceit, pretension, war game, or even art consciousness in mind, but as documentary photographs with the intention to become images of evidence and memory. And as a result, his posing for the picture with Onoda becomes part of an historical moment of self-documentation and the need of the photographer to move from behind the camera to the front stage to prove its truth. While both series were shot using film, Tsukada's could easily have been digitally shot. In contrast to the grainy materiality of the classic wet photography, the digital image is constructed like a mosaic, holding a large amount of pixels, fragments of light already translated into binary code of mathematical combinations of one and zero, a source of information that is anything but a direct imprint. Digital images can be manipulated to an extreme extent without the viewer being able to identify any change or sensing a modified presence. The trick trickery of digitality is complete, successfully deceiving the eye in a contemporary perfected trompe escaping any interpretations that may indicate what is being portrayed unless the image's creator provides any, the information. The difference between these two sets of pictures, therefore, mark the 30-year gap between them and the relative changes and technological advancement between the 1970s and today. In contrast to Suzuki's photographs, Tsukada's images come out of a discourse that relates to issues of fictionality and performativity circumventing issues of reality and evidence of the photographic image. After obtaining the pre preliminary agreement of the twins to model for the series, Tsukada selected the jungle-like environment near his home in Kamakura and led the photographic session there. 
As part of his directing instructions, the brothers were requested to switch roles and change their outfits. As a result, in each picture, without a specific knowledge of the viewer, one is the soldier in full Japanese imperial military gear, while the other is in jeans, t-shirts, and trainers. In the first image, both are dressed in imperial Japanese soldiers in full military gear. One looks at the direction of the camera, while the other turns his gaze aside. In the second image, they watch each other, civilian and soldier, well, while in the third picture, the civilian holds a military knife while both gaze away from the camera. And in the fourth and last image, the civilian dressed brother sits a close to the photographer and looks directly at the camera while the military dressed brother is at some distance and easily merged into the background. Tsukada has stated that one of the reasons for creating this series was his desire to confront the real image of Japanese imperial soldier because since a young age he wanted to, to be face to face with and to see a concrete image of a soldier in person vis-a-vis -vis his personal patriotism and petite nationalistic feeling, quote, as he puts it. The four images, therefore, represent stages in a story of a military man who encounters himself in civilian clothes years later, or a soldier who encounters his grandson through time travel. Seemingly, he has traveled ahead in time to, know, to now pacifist Japan, as if Tsukada has staged the moment of the returning soldiers facing modern Japan for the first time. Experiencing the series as a sequence that moves across time in which the brothers change roles is crucial to my interpretation. Each image functions as a snapshot of a moment in an ongoing process of dressing and undressing and the constant change of identical identities. Sukada's work resides in a spe skeptical, questioning, and untrusting atmosphere, carrying an important level of criticism. In this project, truth is slippery, identities are unclear or doubled. No distinction is drawn between the old and the new, and the war generation is easily mistaken for the pacifist young generation. The qualities of invisibility, deception, indirectness, absence, disguise, camouflage, and belief making become the basic values of Tsukada's work. There is no way to clearly point to which of the brothers is acting the soldier or who is playing the civilian as they keep changing roles. Camouflage, hiding, and disappearance, which sustained Onoda and Yokoi for decades, I will be, be back to Yokoi in a moment, are translated into the escaping visual reality in Tsukada's work. Despite the fact that a set of similar images is present, we do not know what we are looking at or even if the scene is real. The Imperial Army gear has been borrowed from a film set. The identical twins change roles. The jungle is actually the backyard of Tsukada's house. The picture were printed in a traditional C-type print for presenta presentation in a gallery, but also exist in digital format on the internet. Tsukada is conventionally situated behind the camera, directing a fiction, using actors and costumes to perform his ideas and embody, embody his thoughts. He is a non-participant who watches, directs the scene from outside, glancing at the mise-en-scene through his viewfinder, creating a composition he desires. He is a director, not an actor, an observer, not participant, but a photographer who constructs a critical view of Japan that he delivers through the presence of fictional images. These are contemporary images, well situated in the current discourse of art making, yet they carry a certain desire for a romantic aura of the imperial soldier and the jungle settings. The maneuvers of the stories of Onoda's images and Tsukada photography lead to some important debates on photography and invisibility, photography and camouflage. The military discourses on camouflage and invisibility contributes contribute a new perspective to the current discussion of relationship of war and photography, fact and fiction, photojournalism and art photography, 
ethics and aesthetics, and how these all merge together in the experience of camouflage. This discourse is placed vis-a-vis -vis the discussion of photography theory, which embodies the effort to establish central narratives of the mechanically produced visible images, either as a documentary function or fictional interventions. My final reading of the photographs relate to these images as a point of convergence of two Japans, the old military imperial culture of the past in its last phase after the, its collapse and the contemporary pacifist anti-militaristic politics in Japan. As both projects call forth military images for the viewer, they bring forward a consciousness of Japanese involvement in warfare in the imperial past and present a postmodern, post-capitalist societal relationship to war and pacifism. Despite the very different time frame both series are set into and beyond their visual similarity, there is an embryonic link between the two series. They present nearly equal questions on the discourse of national identity that has characterized Japanese society for the past three decades, between the national, imperial, and militaristic, and the private, individual, and pacifist. Yet, the following discussion reveals the gaps and ruptures between these two sets. If you consider Suzuki's images of Onoda, it is clear that the haunting spectres of the dying imperial past were suddenly revived when millions of Japanese had to face their resurrected imperial past as embodied by Onoda's present and his decision to stick to his guns compared with the spirit of New Japan that has denounced war and has taken pacifist neutralist side, inclining towards modernity, industrial and consumer society as is represented in the photograph formed by the presence of Suzuki Norio. There was a flow of mixed feeling in Japan towards the return of Noda and the other stragglers. On one hand, there was pride and admiration for their endurance through the decades of hiding in the jungle, and yet, great embarrassment and criticism of their over-dedication followed by a sharp critique of the education system and the indoctrination of Japanese society went through during the years leading up to, to the war. Onoda and Yokoi Shoichi's return to Japan, Yokoi Shoichi was another famous holdout straggler revealed only two years before the exposure of Onoda, who spent 27 years in hiding in the jungles of Guam. They served as a remainder, reminder of the war and that the, the aggressive military past was still alive, that attitudes toward war and militarism have not completely disappeared if those mummified pieces of evidence emerged from the jungle. Most importantly, with the presence of these living memories, Japan ha was thrown into a public debate on its own responsibility in the war, including its military and colonial past. The issues of invisibility, camouflage, and survival under concealment in jungle circumstances is focused on here as part of my understanding of Onoda's absence from the public sphere and his ghostly presence during the three decades after the Pacific War. As an intelligence officer, Onoda was highly trained in guerrilla tactics used for information gathering with expertise in spying behind the front lines, lines specializing in survival skills, a, capa a capability that he unexpectedly continued to practice for the next three decades. Well, there was great respect for Onoda as a survivor. Whoops, I think I should be here. Um, uh, partly because he was an officer, a graduate of the Nakano School with outstanding jungle, jungle proficiency, combat spirit and dedication in the old Bushido style, Yokoi was viewed as a coward who spent most of his time in Guang lying, lying hidden in a tunnel. The two juxtaposed photographs clearly show, and I just... Uh, scanned it from a book. They, they were originally just just opposed to, together in a um, um, photographic yearbook of um, the 70s. The two juxtaposed photographs clearly show how the images of the two were manipulated by the media. 
Yokoi is presented as a skinny man in a nearly collapsing posture, tattered garments, barefooted and shaven, with big dark circles under his eyes. Onoda, on the other hand, depicts, despite the clearly visible patches and sewing thread on his uniform, seems well-groomed, standing tall, saluting with all his might, presenting an image of an eternal soldier, one who never gives up. However, a closer look at Yokoi's story reveals a large amount of material evidence of his hiding and adaptation to life in the jungle, his amazing ability to weave and sew, his utensils collection, an exceptional design and high quality execution of a hiding and dwelling tunnel with extraordinary skills in identifying suitable foods in the jungle. Yokoi, who was an appr apprentice in a tailor's shop before his departure to war, made extensive use of his acquired skills from weaving and sewing, found jungle fibers, to planning and digging his tunnel under the bamboo grove at the depth of the jungle in Guam. Yokoi represents a state of mind of a human turned back into the natural environment so for survival and continuity that stands in sharp contrast to that of Onoda's military ability. Yokoi, who emerged out of the jungle in a period when Japan just seemed to surface as a new economic power in Asia, simultaneously reconsidering its past through the cons consecutive events of Mishima Yukio's suicide in November 1970 and Hono, Hono, Honda, sorry, Honda Katsuichi's serialized criticism of the events preceding the Nanjing massacre in China and more. Yokoi himself aroused strong sentiments among average Japanese people in the first days of his repatriation as a signifier of a simple rural Japanese man who was thrown into the turmoil of war and historical events regardless of his own will or intention. The first reaction to, reactions to Yokoi have mostly focused on his amazing surviving ability to adapt to the harsh circumstances in the, in the jungle vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pampered lifestyle of the young generation in Japan that already lost any sense of hardship or struggle for existence. Nonetheless, this attitude was very soon replaced with a sense of weirdness and strong suspicions that Yokoi was actually a murderer who was probably involved in the murder of two villagers in Guam, as well as the two colleagues left with him on the island for a period of 20 years. Deeper issues regarding Yokoi's mental stability, including his hallucinations, started to float, with special attention being paid to his contradictory stories of survival, murder, and the questionable death of the two fellow stragglers. Further criticism also came from people who knew him during the war and gave testimonies on his misfit condition to military routines long before his isolation and dubious personal stability. In contrast to Yokoi, who was produce, producing all his necessities in a meticulous and laborious manner, utilizing the natural resources found in the jungle, Odnoda, accompanied by his colleague Kozuka Kinshichi for 27 out of the 29 years, was controlling Lubang Island with the power of his gun, murdering, stealing, and robbing for the locals for all his personal needs. The first picture that you saw that he was handing his sword to uh, Marcos was part of um, uh, the pardon he was given for murdering over 30 people in Lubang. After Kozuka was killed by the police fire in 1972, Onoda was left all by himself, increasing his pressure on the islanders even more. This Tsukada's series was created, however, at different times and under a different atmosphere during the Iraq War and the coalition forces' involvement in air and ground engagements in Iraq in 2003. The U.S. demand from Japan to support and take part in this global effort against Iraq faced mixed feelings and split opinion among the Japanese public. 2003 presented Japan with, a stormy, with stormy debates 
not unfamiliar in the Japanese public sphere whenever winds of war start blowing. The fear of involvement and possible injuries to society were present and public debates were heated and preoccupied with World War II memories, touching upon sensitive issues such as US military bases in Okinawa, continuous threats towards Japan from North Korea, and the delicate negotiation of these issues between Koizumi's government and the Bush administration. Hence, Tsukada's project should be seen in light of these events and the atmosphere at the time of turmoil and fear of over-involvement of Japanese defense forces in the overseas military operation. Although, after 9-11, most of the Japanese public supported the USA-led invasion of Afghanistan with an extensive positive response to Koizomi's steps, there was still disagreement on the shift into the Iraq war and the support of U.S. Navy aircraft refueling on Japanese tankers during this operation, harming the delicate balance of Japanese neutrality in the Middle East. This debate brought the end of Koizumi government in the 2004 elections, and as a result, the pre-Iraq war atmosphere that sided with the easing of the country's ban on collective self-defense was now replaced by a strong opposition as any rel relaxation seemed like blind following the US military police policies. Interestingly, the events in Iraq including another homecoming, but this time of Japanese hostages taken and later released by the Iraqi militia, and during the time of their return to Japan in April 2004, the released hostages were heavily criticized by the media for their travel into government-declared dangerous zones and were accused of self-responsibility, and they had to apologize for their reckless actions. However, the scenes of war, hostages, and Japanese self-defense forces marching in foreign lands had an immense effect on the public. Tsukada's series should be viewed in this specific context. While Yokoi and Onoda's repatriation sparked a fiery dispute on Japan's military past, Tsukada's series was created at the time this sensibility, sensitivity returned. Another 29-year cycle opened here, and the conceptual grain of Tsukada's series is already present in Suzuki's images. Oh, Tsukada's work, oh, I, it's a repeated uh, paragraph here. Um, Tsukada's series executed in 2003, echoes public debates and national deliberation on the possibility of a resurrection of military spirits, this time under the presumed influence of the US and its allies. In photographic language, the logic that led to the execution of Suzuki's images conformed to the discourses of the index as evidence and proof performing the photograph as a document of pre presence that, in that instance, charged with lives of people and altered the course of history. To conclude my discussion of this series, I would like to consider Tsukada's appropriation of Diane Arbus' title, Identical Twins, which locates the series on yet another plane, that of the borderline between Japan and its greater other, America. Diane Arbus' Identical Twins, Rossell, New Jersey, 1967, is one of her most famous images that had attracted much attention and writings over the years. Carol Armstrong's consideration of the image wisely looks at the issues of reproduction in biology as well as in photography as the central theme of this image. Photograph, argues Armstrong, scrutinizes, quote, how sameness mutates into difference, unquote, and therefore it is successful in the aber aberration of identicalness, and instead of photography as apparatus, it represents photography as reproduction, as mutation. Abbas' image is about the identicality of the twins, or more precisely, about the almost identical presence of the two. Tsukada's series, on the other hand, is about the impossibility to separate between the twins or to identify them as different. Abbas' twins represent American bourgeois culture of the 1960s, its dreams and aspirations, its motivations and perversions. 
in their neat and identical dresses, Abba's twins are facing front as if presented to the viewer's gaze for inspection, comparison, and evaluation. The viewer is invited to examine if they are really similar, if their dresses and bodily gestures are identical, only to be able to find their individuality in this copulation and being astonished at the natural peculiarity of duplication. Sukanda series, on the other hand, hides, camouflages, and masquerades the twins so that they escape any chance of clear identification or differentiation. His is not concerned with issues of similarity or an identicality, but in their relationship to each other and their relationship with the anonymous viewer. Abbas twins direct their gaze into the viewers through the mediation of the camera and the photo photographer who simultaneously becomes medium and absence. Tsukada's twins, conversely, look at each other away from the camera, occasionally hiding at the camera's viewer, and only in the final image does one of them direct his gaze at the camera while the other fades into the background. Tsukada's twins are enclosed with their own world while the viewer's experience of the scene becomes voyeuristic, as if stretching up on one's toes to see over the shoulder of the photographer, so to speak. It is, however, Suzuki's image that tricked, triggered the twin effect of the compa comparative impulse by his jump from behind the camera to the front to join Onoda-san in their joint picture. Forty years on, David Siegel of the Washington Post located the twin sisters of Arbus image. The recent image of the twin girls from Rossell and Jay is strikingly vibrant, illuminated with bright colors, pale blue eyes, blonde hair, light green suits, and vivid pink nail varnish of two young-looking women in an image that stands in sharp contrast to the grim atmosphere of darkness and awe of their famous childhood photograph. The relationship of the present image with the appropriation of Arbus photograph works as a deconstruction of time and space in a double death of both photographs. Like Siegel, so did Judith Kawaguchi seek the elderly Onoda for the Japan Times. And so in this recent image of Onoda Hiro, the viewer sees an outwardly common, dignified, harmless-looking, well-dressed elderly Japanese gentleman. Nothing in the photograph reveals his former experience and identity as the center figure of one of the most controversial stories of Japanese military in the post-war era, or hints at the long and complicated history of the troubled mindsets of the time. This photograph of Onoda, now 89 years old, even more, is like 92 now, is an image that embraces the doubleness of identities I have presented throughout this paper. Onoda, as a contemporary modernized Japanese citizen, his past concealed and invisible contains within himself the multiplicity of Japan. War and pacifism, imperialism and modernity, the bushy spirit and private life, violence and calmness. The famous pictures of the wartime imperial military officer in the jungle surrounding stand in sharp contrast to this recent portrait that represents a desire for normality. Moreover, after returning to Japan from his second exile in Brazil, after he came to Japan a year later, he went to Brazil and spent 12 years with his brother in Brazil, and then finally returned to Japan in mid-80s. Onoda started his own school of nature survival skills for children, an institute active to the present day. Onoda is now a member of one of the right-wing parties in Japanese politics, a movement that struggles to bring the values and ideals of the nationalistic time of the early 20th century back into present-day society. His presence in this current photograph ironically becomes the actual moment of camouflage when his history, personality, and deeds do not surface as signifiers. Only his performance as a common, harmless-looking aged Japanese man is an intriguing embodiment of the camouflage dilemmas brought forward through the images and ideas I discuss today. If to borrow Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's wording, becoming imperceptible is becoming like everyone. 
as translated from the French, the venir tout le monde, ça veut dire faire le monde, becoming everyone, that is, becoming everything. The images introduced here reside in the gaps among documentary photographies, art photography, and photojournalism, gallery, personal, and newspaper images, traditional wet photography and digital projections, camouflage, hiding, and exposure, imperial, post-war, and contemporary Japan, Japan, the Pacific War, the Pacific Islands, and the US, performing for, participating in, and directing images, I've also paid special attention to identifying the problems residing between issues of indexicality and performance, camouflage, and photographic image. But above all, these photographs challenge the viewer's conception of the visual experience in a realm that destabilizes the known relationship between fact and fiction in photography. We now know that together with the ubiquitous presence of photography in our contemporary lives, the medium has transformed its status as proof or evidence and simultaneously has moved on to become a legitimate tool of art making, possibly one of the most dominant media in the contemporary art scene. With a double process of transformation into digitality and the loss of factual indexical quality. Photography could easily move into the territory of art as an arena of critical views, as a process questioning normative and regulating procedures in contemporary lives. In this context, Tsukada's images should be considered part of a growing body of Japanese works of art that question the norms and silence taboos of Japanese society to present a critical and more complex view of the Japanese cultural and historical circumstances. Thank you very much.